And I'm here to talk about one aspect of national security strategy, that's the resource side. But before I do so, let me just uh, put this in context. Um, before I and, uh, put it in, in context for all of us, um, because I think that national security strategy is central to how we understand and respond to and manage our security environments. Okay, I have a question, and we'll do a show of hands. For the people who are not in uniform, non-military, non-police, non-gendarme, etc. How many people have been taught about strategy at school or university? Who've gone to a class at strategy, the civilians? Okay. Um, of the, for those who have not gone to a formal class on strategy, how many people have worked on strategy before? on strategy or strategic document, etc. Okay. S strategy, there are many complex intellectual ways to define it. But the simplest way is how do you use what you have to accomplish what you want to do? That's basically strategy. Whether you went to university, you went to military school or not, it's basically how do you use what you have to accomplish what you want to do. And in this case, what we want to do is security. Generally, if you go to um, business school, strategy is all about your business plan. If you go to... Um, uh, civil service um, school, they will talk about doing a st strategic plan, or it's around the process, or it's around the budget process. Whatever it is, it has to do with focusing our attention on something we want to accomplish. But the question then becomes, for you not in uniform, working with people who are in uniform, is how do you take those skills and that knowledge and apply it to problem solving in something as complex as security. Yesterday we talked a little bit about what is security in, in, in Africa, and I think I might be okay to summarize it as security in Africa is not about war fighting exclusively. It's about nation building, it's about economic opportunity, it's about a lot of things beyond war fighting. So now, question for those in uniform, and I know you've all gone to a class on strategy. There are two texts that usually underpin strategy. The first is The Art of War. How many people are familiar with the book The Art of War? How many people have read The Art of War? <laughs> Okay, could someone tell me who wrote The Art of War? Okay, actually we don't know. <laughs> it is attributed to Jean Xu. Most of the chapters, most of the ch 13 chapters are attributed to him. Not all of them. But I'd just like to draw attention to those of you who have read it and who are familiar with it. There are two chapters I'd like to um, highlight here. And uh, I wouldn't advise you know, the uh, uninitiated to go Google it and read it. It's a little dense. But there are two chapters. Chapter 11, called The Nine Situations. And uh, Chapter 8, called Variations and Tactics. Okay? For those who did not go to war college like me, um, Chapter 11, I think, is very, very illuminating. Because it talks about nine different situations that a planner has to contend with when he's face, he or she is facing an adversary. And I think it's very important for us here. Because generally, when you look at national security strategy, it becomes very static. We have a strategy and that's our strategy. Forgetting that, it has to be a document that is responsive. So even the art of war acknowledges the need for the flexibility that um, Dr. Kuo was talking about in chapter 11. 
Chapter 8 on variations and tactics talks a little bit about how you adjust. And it's very important for us to get these two um, points because I'll come to the adjustment and flexibility later. There's a second, there's a second book that military colleges um, discuss a little bit. It's called On War. How many people are familiar with On War? Fewer. Who wrote On War? Yes, Carl von Clausewitz. And why, uh, why it's important is because our thinking about war evolved over time. And people who experienced different types of war, okay, theorized about how planners like yourselves should address security issues. But the important thing about on war, it's one of the first times we started seeing thinkers incorporating strategy beyond the military in a stra military strategic document. Because a lot of on war talks about the confluence of politics and military action. And if we fast forward to today, the confluence we're talking about is politics, it's economics, it's ideology, it's socioeconomic issues, ethnicity, inequality, etc., and of course, insecurity. So what am I saying? Basically, whether you are in uniform or not, what we are facing in Africa, as far as strategy is concerned, is evolving, it's complex, and it's multidimensional. This means that, one, everything the uniformed people learned is important, it's relevant. Everything the non-uniformed people have either learned or experienced is also important and relevant. Because a lot of what we learned at war college or university has to do with one country fighting another country, or one adversary facing another adversary. What we are facing in Africa today is many adversaries interacting with each other in ways that I don't think we have theorized sufficiently. So when you think about strategy, before I talk about uh, the resource side, one point I would like to leave, if you forget everything I said today, and remember one thing, it should be that the process is more important than the product. The way you design and, de and um, develop your national security strategy is more important than the end document. Why is this so? Because if you approach your national security strategy with a good understanding of what insecurity is, not just in your country, but in the region, you recognize that the process has to include the economists, the political scientists, the environmentalists, and a broad range of um, stakeholders that we don't usually consider when we're thinking about theory or grand theory in a conventional sense. Okay, so there are theory, um, strategy is using what you have to accomplish what you um, intend. So I'll be talking about the what you have part of it. And basically, what does Africa have? What do African countries have to um, you know, execute um, strategy? Uh, this slide shows three front pages of the Economist magazine. In 2000, you could see the caption was the hopeless continent. By 2011, it changed to Africa rising. 2013, we're aspiring Africa. So what changed between 2000 and 2013 that led to this 
e evolution of media perspectives of the continent as a whole. One important part of it is economic growth. African economies have been growing at a pretty fast and consistent rate. Usually on average for the past 10, 15, no, 15 to 20 years, over 5% per annum. Compare this with a global average that has, you know, gone between 1% per annum to about 3% per annum on, in, on a good year. Africa is doing pretty well. That is until you ask two important questions. The first is, the economies are growing, but the population is growing faster. And so even if it's growing at 6%, if the population is growing at 8% per annum, it means you have more people to take care of and uh, less to um, spread around. The second part is the inequality side. Because a growing economy only talks about how much the economy is producing, not who is benefiting. And what we are seeing across the African continent is a huge gap between those who are benefiting and those who are still struggling. And that, is, that remains a challenge. And so the backdrop is African economies are doing a little better. They're producing more. Countries are earning more. Um, uh, Inequality is still a problem, um, and the demographic pace of growth and the needs that Africa has means that, um, you know, there's not that much to go around. So let's come back to strategy. What do we want when we're talking about strategy? We want countries that are stable, that are secure, that have citizens whose welfare is taken care of. People feel safe and comfortable. What is it going to take to do that? It's basically going to take resources. And uh, I think that resources for Africa come from two main areas. The first is domestic, and the second is external. Domestic, how many, um, dom dom domestic there are two main ways that um, countries um, raise funding. The first is food taxation. African countries tax their citizens and tax, tax businesses and institutions and raise money, right? Secondly, if they don't make enough money through taxation, they borrow. They borrow domestically, they borrow externally. Are we all together on this? So if African countries are growing, GDP growth is increasing, it should mean that taxation is also increasing, right? How many people feel that, believe that GDP growth means greater tax revenue for African countries? How many people think it does not necessarily apply. How many people just cannot be bothered and want me to carry on? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's an important question because usually at this point you ask the crucial question. If a country has raised revenue, it's not all going to security. Some of it is going to infrastructure, some of it is going for schools, others going for hospital. How do we determine how much goes to security relative to everything else? Depending on trees, for example, the trees that we have in the country. Threats. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Depending on threats, okay. Um, it could be threat dri driven, um, and it could be driven by our perception of other needs. 
and it could also be um, driven by availability of resources. Because even if we, in the best, best, best case scenario, okay, we say, oh, we have threats, serious threats, but we haven't raised enough taxation. Then what do we do? Do we take the entire budget and put it to security? We can't. So threats are one aspect, but there are many other variables that determine how it goes. It's important for you as national security professionals to understand this. Because, as I said, the process is more important than the product. At some point, you are either going to be writing papers, advising your principals, or yourselves making presentations about what you need to address the threats. And what you need relative to everything else. Across the African continent, um, the average what they call the tax effort. That is, the amount of tax that African countries collect as a percentage of the amount of tax they should be receiving is less than 20%. Less than 20%. And so domestically, African countries are constrained as far as taxation is concerned. They can do one of two things either spend less or raise more by way of taxation. And by the tax effort, I'm not talking about increasing the rate of taxation, the tax rates, it's just collecting what you're supposed to collect. Collect less than 20% of what we're supposed to collect on the continent. Domestically, it's either through taxation or borrowing. Externally, so let's say we've decided we're not going to, um, we've reach the maximum of what we can get um, domestically. Um, what are the external sources? We could have friendly governments, bilateral assistance. You could have multilateral institutions like the UN system, the World Bank, the African Development Bank could also provide resources. Multilateral agencies like the World Bank, the UN system, the African Development Bank, or commercial sources. African countries um, borrow a lot um, commercially, even, in the, even for the security sector. So if you add everything that African countries receive domestically and externally, that's the total envelope of resources available for African countries to address all their challenges. Um, this um, this um, uh, um, chart shows the uh, tax effort. It's um, you know significantly below 20 percent for most countries and this just means that if countries make an effort to collect the taxes that they should be collecting, they could, in this case, receive four times more than they do currently in terms of um, fiscal revenue. <coughs> There's something called illicit financial flows, IFF. Uh, this is the amount of money that leaves the African continent every year. Um, through commercial, criminal, and corruption sources. Um, there are a number of, of um, scholars who have studied this, and the OECD in Paris has a task force looking at this at the moment. Um, this um, chart looks at um, you know, three different estimates of how much money is leaving the African continent every year. Um, it um, looks at uh, it's uh, through illicit financial flows, um, corruption, bad contracts, bad uh, mining contracts, and um, uh, commercial um, malfeasance. Currently, the estimate is between sixty and 
$1.40 billion every year leaves Africa every year. Total aid that all 54 African countries receive every year is about 56, 57 billion. So basically, if Africa could address illicit financial flows, it doesn't need aid. And we'll talk to you a little bit about why it's important to increase uh, domestic sources of financing, particularly for security purposes. This is just another um, diagram showing total um, receipts by the African continent for, by both aid and um, foreign direct investment and um, losses, outflows, um, because of corruption and bad trade practices. The, um, these are 2012 um, figures from a 2013 um, publication, but it illustrates the um, point, I think, quite well. So before we talk about um, U.S. Um, assistance um, as part of the amount of resources that African countries have in the, in, in the financial sector. So um, let's look at, um, this is um, U.S. Um, assistance to the continent. Um, most of it is um, development-related uh, assistance, um, but we do have, we do provide assistance, um, military assistance in the form of IMET, that's training, FMS, that's um, foreign military sales, and FMF, that's financing for um, the purchase of um, security sector assets. Um, as I said earlier, this is just one example of um, bilateral assistance. Um, Africa receives its, an assistance from a number of various um, places. And that's... Um, <coughs> so, back to um, the gentleman's question. How do we determine um, what goes to the um, security sector? And as I mentioned earlier, the process is important because once African countries have an idea of total amount domestically and total that they could get from external sources, sources the conversation begins. How do we apply that to national and at times um, re regional and sub-regional threats? I think the first thing is in there are a number of uh, principles of um, budgeting and public expenditure management, and I'll just talk about three. Um, the first is my uh, favorite, um, which does not usually translate very well when it comes to security issues, and that is contestability. When you have scarce resources, you have to make choices. And the choice between a uh, security threat, say terrorism, and a social need, say poverty, becomes a discussion that security and non-security people are going to need to have. Because remember, the goal is not just war fighting. The goal is security for all citizens, which includes addressing poverty, which includes addressing new threats, which also includes, you know, investing in schools and uh, hospitals. And so the first thing that we, we need, if we're going to do national security strategy well, is to have a process where each part of the security apparatus, uniformed and non-uniformed, could discuss, debate, and justify what they need within the context. The reason I've gone through all of these um, sources of revenue is because usually, particularly people in uniform, have immediate needs. And they don't understand why the country doesn't understand this is a priority. But I think if you have a better sense of 
where the money is coming from and how much exists in the envelope, then this issue of contestability becomes, you know, an issue. The second issue that determines what goes to the, I think could determine what goes to the security sector, is a principle of um, accountability. We usually think, ab think about security being accountable to the Constitution, but the Constitution um, supports the people, not necessarily a regime or an ideology. And so in thinking about how we ensure accountability, it's not just as regards you know, the efficiency of expenditure, it also regards what sort of impacts is my spending today ensuring that we see in five, ten years. And so accountability becomes an important part. And the third is comprehensiveness. And this is an area that I think, particularly in the security sector, we generally miss. Because you look at the security budget for most African countries, it's really small in the budget document. But if you look at security spending, and there are many ways to estimate security spending, um, look at security spending, it's a lot more than appears in the budget. And so if you're spending a lot more than the country has, you're destabilizing the country economically. And you're making it more likely for poverty and inequality to bring unrest and complicate your security environment. So comprehensiveness is not just about being accountable. Comprehensiveness is also about ensuring that you are meeting your end state goal, which is security for all citizens. It is a complex and comprehensive um, issue. Uh, tomorrow we'll be talking a little, no, this afternoon we'll be talking a little bit about um, regional um, security issues. But um, I think the most recent um, um, example, and I could, we could probably, I could probably get, um, how many people are following the most recent efforts to finance peace and security in the African Union led by Donald Kaberuka, former African Development Bank president? How many people know that the AU is trying to do exactly what the lady um, just uh, asked? Okay, so that's a different conversation. And I'll make sure that we have copies in your discussion groups, because I'd like you to take a look at this and uh, say, does this make sense? Is this the sort of common pool that will allow us to respond regionally to emerging and asymmet asymmetrical threats? In closing, I think we need to be thinking more about uh, a more strategic model when it comes to resourcing the security sector. Right now, it's very ad hoc. A country could say, I need 10 helicopters, I need 20 more troops, we need um, in intel to address um, extremists, but we don't have a collective, um, a, a strategic approach that puts everything on the table and you know how you know the various issues support each other. I think the first important um, aspect of this is we need to build a lot more integrity. Um, no, I'm not saying that um, every process on the African continent is immoral or corrupt. I'm not saying corruption is a main issue. I'm saying corruption is an issue. And it's more important in countries. Corruption is everywhere in the world, right? Not just in Africa. But what makes it most important in Africa is because where you have fewer resources, you have your margin for error and mistakes and missteps is a lot slimmer. And so I think the first thing is we have to address the um, integrity issue. Secondly, I think we have to ensure that we, the process is more transparent. And by being more transparent, I don't mean just reporting to the donors what you're doing. I mean having a process where the citizens and civil society are also involved in the strategic decisions for resourcing, because the citizens also understand security. They want security. 
and making them part of that could only be a win-win as far as I'm concerned. Third, I think we need to find ways to reward good performance and sanction bad actors when it comes to the management and utilization of security sector resources. You can talk about many different guiding principles. I think that when it comes to managing, particularly what I think is a major issue in um, the resource side in Africa's security sector, particularly when it comes to procurement and budget management, corruption, I can think of no better guiding principle than an African guiding principle, which is the African Union's convention on preventing and uh, combating corruption. This is not something somebody else brought to Africa, it's something that Africans themselves um, recognized as an issue. And I think that uh, the convention talks about you need to strengthen manpower, you need to prioritize public financial reviews in the security sector, and I think um, we need to do a little bit more than hoping things would be better. As a lot of people say, hope is not a strategy. We need real national security strategies that help countries think through how they utilize what they have and what they could get to um, achieve their end states. Um, moving ahead, domestic, and I know I'm way over, domestic and external um, ways to address this. These are just some thoughts um, for you to um, mull over as you go to your discussion groups, um, because if we don't have the resources, if Africa continues to be funded almost exclusively from outside for security, you have no control over the agenda. And you can't plan for many years, which is what Africa needs. And so the resource part of national security strategy is one that I think both uniformed and uh, civilian uh, professionals need to pay a lot more attention to. Don't leave it just to the economists and the budget people. It is a process that involves all of us, and it makes the outcome a lot more certain, secure, and sustainable. Thank you.